and 9 how that uh, the Lord God planted a garden east and he put man in the garden and he he made every, verse 9, he, Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. Now, if you've not been involved in our Wednesday night studies, we're not trying to dissect every verse. Uh, we're not trying to talk about where Eden is or where was Eden. We're not, we're not getting into that. Um, what we're trying to do is approach this book this book, the Genesis book, the book of beginnings, to get a proper biblical as best as we can from this book and in comparison to the entire canon of Scripture, we're trying to get good theology. Because if you don't have good theology, you're probably going to have bad doctrine, okay, bad teachings. So we're trying to understand, and I'm not claiming because he's way up there, I'm way down here. His thoughts are far above my thoughts. I'm not claiming to, and I'm even scared to even use the word understanding, that I have understanding of God. I'm scared of that word. Uh, but at the same token, I do believe that He gave us His word so that we could know about Him, what He wants us to know about Him. And I'm learning the more you study His word, the more you get to know about Him and you get to know Him. And let me say it in love, uh, I don't know how you get to know Him apart from studying His Word. You're kind of left to the whims of your own, uh, uh, how shall I say it, your, your own demeanors, your own psyche, your own makeup. And that's what Jesus plainly says, if to follow Him, you have to give up your life, your suke, your psyche. You have to give those things up so that you can even follow Him. So there's my, uh, my preface, okay? So when we're looking at this, what we're trying to comprehend, and this is, this is one of the things that I think that we understand, even though it's simple and very practical, we understand that God desires the pleasant for his creatures. Every pleasant food, every good food. Uh, when, when you and I look at the sky, is it pleasant to look at? Why is it blue? Well, because God in his infinite wisdom and in his infinite creation of the sky, knowing he was also going to make you, that's why he made it blue, because blue is a very pleasant color for us to look at. It's not, uh, it's, it's not uh, Pepto-Bismol pink. Can you, can you imagine living in a world that was Pepto, pep, you know, it just kind of turns my stomach thinking about getting up every day and looking at a pink sky and, 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 and unless, let's say unless I was created to love pink, does that make sense? So there's a lot of things that when we look at just the creation, it lets us know something about God, which is what? God is pleasant. God's good. The presence of God is intended to be pleasant. Why isn't it? Well, it's because of sin. The fallen nature makes it unpleasant. Once that is moved out of the way, then the presence and of God is, is pleasant. We see that He made good for food. God desires to provide good and pleasant things for His creation, the birds of the air. I think we may have talked about this, the flowers of the field. Have you ever wondered why did God why put flowers in a field? Why? He didn't have to, but He did. They have an aroma. They have a smell. Uh, they, did, he, did he have to? No, but he did. Is, is this making sense? And so it, it lets you kind of know a little bit about the intricate details of God in his, in his makeup to, uh, uh, and I'm not trying to downgrade it or make light of it, but, but God adds a splash of color. It, that green field needs a splash of yellow. That green field needs a splash of white. 
And when we, when we look at it, we can look at a green field, but most of us acknowledge that when we see the flower in the field, it changes our heart towards the field. It's more pleasant. And God wants that uh, for us. So when we consider, I don't know if we got into all of this before, but I just want to make kind of a note of it. When we consider the condition of the coming kingdom, when you look at how it's going to be, Revelation chapter number 20. Um, if I didn't cover it, we'll cover it now. If I did, I apologize. But Revelation 21, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So the Bible teaches in Revelation chapter 20 that we are legitimately headed into a thousand-year kingdom, which is going to be void of the presence of Lucifer. Lucifer is going to be bound, according to Revelation chapter 20, for a thousand years. Isaiah 11, 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor. This is talking about the king of this kingdom, which is talking about Jesus Christ. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked, and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. It's amazing. Look at what it says in verse 6, Isaiah eleven six. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, talking about the goat, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. This is where... This is where we're headed. Now, the, the devil wants us to think, no, we're headed into annihilation. No, he's headed into annihilation. He's headed into annihilation. The, the, the devil wants us to think, oh, humanity's going to be annihilated. No, the wicked are going to be annihilated. That's where we're headed. And so when we, when we think in these terms, the pleasant God of Genesis is who made the garden of Genesis and put man in it is the same God. He's still in control. He's not went anywhere, and we are headed. Isn't it interesting? At the resurrection, what did Mary think Jesus was when she saw him? The Bible plainly says in the gospel, she supposed him to be the what? The gardener. Isn't it interesting? So we've got... We've got a garden situation. We got Jesus after the resurrection in that garden tomb. Mary didn't recognize him, thought, okay, maybe he's the gardener who's keeping the garden. Well, the truth is, in the grand scheme of things, he is the gardener that is keeping the garden. The first Adam failed. Jesus is the second Adam, and he did not fail, and he isn't failing. And so... The, the intent, for lack of better words, and I'm not, I don't have a really good vocabulary, but the intent of God is still on course. It's still on track, which is what? For God to dwell with man in paradise. Still on track. And that's where the people of God, the children of God, 
That's, that's where we're going to end up. Even on this planet, I'm not even talking about heaven. This millennial reign is on this planet. This is going to take place on this planet, okay? And then there, there's a whole new heaven and new earth that Revelation talks about. So what does this mean? Well, it, it means that if, if I want to have proper theology, I need to, I need to acknowledge I am, I, I am created by a pleasant, good God. Okay, a pleasant good God, can his wrath be kindled? Yes. Will he pour out his wrath? Yes. But does he prefer to extend grace? Obviously. Why is it obvious? He gave his son and poured out his wrath on his own son so that I could be saved and escape his wrath. Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I, 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 I was going to go down a rabbit trail, but we'll not. Okay. So now go with me, if you would. When you look, we're going to go ahead. That was actually supposed to be review. All right. So now verse number 16. Verse number 16. This will be a little bit new. Okay. And the Lord God commanded the man. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, verse 15. I, let, let's, let's, not, let's not jump verse 15. Let's go back to verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden. Look at what it says, to dress it and to keep it. So tonight we want to spend the rest of our time and I want to share with you what, uh, you know, we used to have what is known as the gold standard, and that's how you kn knew the value of your money. It was all based upon gold. It's no longer that. It's fictitious now. But I want to talk about the God standard, okay? What's the God standard? Okay, here we are. We're looking into what God has done. He's made a pleasant garden. And then what did he do? He put man and eventually woman in it. And what were they to do? They were to dress it and to keep it. Okay? When we look at this, God is a God who has created a creation... <laughs> That, that works. It's active. Okay? We're trying to understand God, right? So, we, okay, God's a pleasant God, but here's what we need to also understand about God. By looking at His creation, God is an active God. He is, he's not like the mythological gods. The mythology gods, what are they doing? They're laid back. They're these big fat gods. What's Buddha? He's the big fat god. And they're, they're laid back. All of these myth, mytholo, mythological gods, they're all laid back and they're, they're every now and then shooting a lightning bolt. Zeus is shooting a lightning bolt out of a fingertip because somebody did something that he didn't like. And everybody's running around trying to appease the gods that are non-existent. They're made up by men. We got that? Okay. Our God's active. The one true God's active. How do we know that? We know that through his, through his creation. Everything is active. Everything's moving. The, 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 as, as, er, everything that we can see has activity about it. The fact that we can see is an activity. Uh, the... The things that we can't see, that we get a microscope and we see, and when we look at them, we find, oh, wait a minute, there's activity. There's something going on all the time. Everything is moving. So what, what's this thing? Everything is in motion. So God is a God of activity, a God of motion. Um, 
uh, when we when we look at this, it it gives us an understanding. He made he made man. Well, what did, well we we did we acknowledged this. Man's first full day was a day of rest. He was created on the sixth day, and on the seventh day he rested. Amen. And God plays that out, and we're going to look at that, and I got to get to it. But the reality is, is he placed man in the garden, and he said, "Now get to work. Get to work. Dress it, and keep it." Adam was is not laid back and got lions and bears bringing him grapes and that's that's not that's not how this goes okay the 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 truth is and the the truth is is the minute Adam quit doing his job Lucifer starts courting his wife that's what happened he was to dress it. Well, what does, what does this mean? It means that he is to uh, basically teal it, but he was to keep it. What does that mean? He was to guard it. It was Adam's responsibility and Eve's responsibility to dress and to keep it. It was given to them. They were to care for it and they were to guard it. What happens? It, apparently it appears, as we'll go on in the book of Genesis, that Adam lets down his guard. And Lucifer begins to court his wife and questions God. When we look at this, God works and mankind is supposed to work. We are trying to learn of God. From the beginning, we see God is active. Uh, uh, Psalm 121, verse 1 says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth, he will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. God doesn't rest. God neither sleeps nor slumbers. When I say rest, I'm talking about in the way that we have to sleep. He doesn't do that. Matthew, uh, uh, let me make sure... Yeah, that's what I need to do before I go the wrong direction. So God's creation works. Uh, revelation. Nope, sorry. When I don't number my pages, I lose track. Uh, consider the vegetation of a forest. It is constantly reproducing. reproducing. You just look at a forest itself. Uh, you leave a forest unattended, and guess what? You come back the next year, you're going to have trees you didn't have. They're going to be little saplings. The very reality that we, we are in a cycle, the creation is in a cycle. The creation operates like this. We want to think that cre we want to think that we're involved in a you see, and we are not, even Christianity is, it's not. Christianity is not degrees. Almost every cult that you can get yourself involved in, you go through a series of degrees. Okay? When you, when you are approached by an organization or you approach an organization and you're looking at something that says you got to go through these degrees, you're climbing quote unquote, you even hear some Southern Gospel songs talk about climbing Jacob's ladder. Ugh. It's it's these degrees. Well, that's not what we're going through. Okay? We do have in Scripture the Psalms of degrees. Don't let that be used against against the truth. The Psalms of degrees were literal songs that they sang as they walked up the staircase to Solomon's temple. They would walk up so many steps, there would be a degree there. There would be a platform. You would sing a psalm, and then you would walk up another set and sing a psalm. Those are the psalms of degrees. And those degrees, each psalm was preparing your heart for the presence of God once you got to the temple. Okay, but that, that preparing our heart to worship, yes. Using that 
as an example and an illustration to say this is your relationship with God? No. We are expanding in grace. Okay? Our relationship with God is a seed being sown and life coming out of that seed. That's what, that, those are the, the, that's what the Word is called. The Word is called a seed, an incorruptible seed actually. So what we're in, involved in is, a, is an outward growing. We are expanding in grace. That's what, we're, that's what we're going through. So when we look at creation itself, it's, it's a reproducing creation. Uh, when you look at the migration of birds, migration of birds, what do they do? Here's what they do. They fly into a place. They'll eat fruit. After they eat the fruit, they will fly away. And you know what they'll do? They'll deposit a seed through their manure. A seed will actually be sown in another part, another place. By what? A bird. A process. Uh, consider bees. What do bees do? Bees pollinate. They're buzzing around. And they're pollinating. If you want an interesting study, study bees. Bees do all of their direction from the sun. When they come back to the hive, I'll, I'll do this real quick. I had a friend who was a beekeeper because this is neat. They come back to the hive and they do a dance in front of the hive. And what that dance is, is the, this bee is giving direction to the other bees where he just found flowers. So they'll do the dance. And here, but the dance is the directions. And here's how every direction of the bee starts. Starts this. Head towards the sun and take a left or heads towards the sun and take a right. That's the way they leave that hive, which is a very deeper spiritual thing that you can look into, which is pretty cool. But, but what is it? Who created those bees? Who's created this creation? This is what God has done. And so God is trying to let us know, I'm not dormant, I'm active. Even when you think I'm not doing anything, I'm doing something, okay? Even when it seems like nothing's going on, even when it seems like there's no progress being made, even when it seems like this isn't, this isn't, oh, I'm in a season of, ugh. Even when you think it's dormant, it's not dormant. Even when trees, the trees look dead, that's when the sap is actually doing its greatest work. It is doing more life-giving work than it was when it was catching the rain. So when we think... Right now, it may even seem like in the world, God's not doing anything. Oh, God's doing. God's working. Okay? So, Proverbs 6, 6, Go to the ant, <laughs> thou sluggard. Consider her ways. I think it's interesting that the Lord told Solomon to use the female pronoun here. Consider her ways. Why do I think that's interesting? Because I think sometimes... Men can be a little bit more lazy than women. That's just my opinion. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep and a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and I want as an armed man. So the Lord teaches us in other parts of Scripture that, yeah, uh, He's pro-work, and it's good to work. Uh, God is about fruitfulness. Uh, in Genesis 1.28, if you go back a chapter, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So we see then that God meant for man to be fruitful. Uh, when you consider what Jesus teaches in John chapter 15, we don't have time to read that. I've taken too long and other things. But go back, read John chapter 15. What does he say? He said, without me you can do nothing. 
But the whole thing is you're, you're the branch. I'm the vine. What's he talking about? He's talking about producing fruit. Jesus was about growth, fruit. Uh, the Holy Spirit has His own fruit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26 tells us of the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, when we look at verse number 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden. When we look at the fact that there's a garden, we see the activity of creation. We have an act of God. When we look at the command, dress it and keep it, we see that God gave man a purpose. God gave man a purpose. So, when we consider the work standard, what is the work standard? Exodus chapter 20, verse 9. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. We got a seven day work week. God says, you need to work six days. Work six days. And rest on the seventh. I think some of the reason why I get wore out is because I, I don't rest on that seventh day. I don't, I don't pause. I don't, I don't take the day and I don't spend time. With, when I do that, I'm refreshed, I'm strengthened, I'm able to go on. When I, when I don't do that, it doesn't take long, and I'm starting to get a little bit uh, manic, for lack of better words. Uh, modern day illustration proof, Chick-fil-A, they've proven. You don't have to work on Sundays. You don't have to, you'll be fine, you know. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, we look at is, the, the, now let me say, say it this way, and I'm speaking to Chris, and God's really, I spent the time with God studying this, and God's really spoken to me about this. He genuinely has. Uh, be sure you're working the six days. Be, be sure you're working. Uh, I think sometimes what we try to do is we try to avoid work as much as we can. Uh, has anybody ever told you when you're leaving their presence, and they mean no harm, but they'll say, don't work too hard. Anybody ever told you that? It's kind of, I don't know if it's a southern thing or if it, it's made its way above the Mason-Dixon line. I don't know. But don't, don't work too hard. And I'm like, so what you're telling me is, do minimal. Uh, you know, we don't mean nothing by it. But it, it's, it's contradictory to God saying, work hard, and you'll be glad you did. You'll be glad. Um, don't take this wrong. I like working. I like it. I like to work. I like to be productive. I like I was talking to your husband today at lunch, and our struggle is, is we don't want to quit working. <laughs> you know? And we do know that there's coming a day when you got to let something go, but what are you going to do for the rest of your days? And so God being my helper, I, I want to be doing something. Okay? i got to move on. John 9, 4. This is the words of Jesus. I must work the works of Him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. If that is not a message to the church of Jesus Christ, he says, I must do the works of him that sent me while it is day. If you look at John chapter number 17, Jesus is praying to God the Father, and he's saying, as you have sent me, I have sent them. If there is anything that the church needs to absorb, is that we have been sent just like Jesus has been sent. And we need to get the work done because there's coming a night. There's coming a darkness when the work that we can do now will not be able to be done. We, yeah, we will not be able to do it, you see. 
And Jesus knew that in his own ministry, his earthly ministry, if you please. And he's like, I have got to get done what I was sent to do. Now, here's a good question. Have you ever heard the passage of Scripture where Jesus, or excuse me, where Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. All of us want to hear, we want to hear well done. But there's just some things about that. One, to hear well done, you got to get done what you were called to do. And to get done what you were called to do, you got to start. <laughs> you got to start. And it's a lot easier, and I'm saying it, I'm not trying to be mean, but it is so much easier to sit back and say, oh, I just wish I knew what God's will is. I just want to do God's will. I wish He'd tell me what His will is for me. I just don't know what His will is. There's a list of things already written down that He wants us all to do. So I would encourage us to start there. And He might get more specific as we get those things done. Amen. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know, this is the Apostle Paul writing this, for yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travailed night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample or example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Wow. That's a, that's a mouthful, isn't it? But the Apostle Paul is teaching he, by example. Nobody gave him a piece of bread that he hadn't worked for. He worked with them. He came alongside people and worked with them. Well, I, I don't want to get off on a, on a, on a tangent, but, but consider, consider those that don't work. All right? Um, when you look, and, and we'll close with this. I've got so much more scripture to share with you. But when you consider... The, 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 the creatures, the animals. Well, some would say, well, a bird doesn't work. And no, he doesn't. He doesn't plow the field. Jesus tells us that. He toils not. He spins not. He doesn't. God provides the food. But have you ever seen a bird setting and, and worms just crawling to it? Every bird I've ever seen goes out and acknowledges, oh, there's a worm bends over, picks it up, and eats it. That's illustrated for us in, in, in the story of the manna. Jesus made it rain bread, basically. They came out and found manna. But you know what they were supposed to do? They had to gather it. They had to gather it. So who, what animals don't work? Uh, those that are in captivity. They don't. Somebody throws them food over the bars. What humans don't work, those in captivity? Someone slides them food through a door or in a cafeteria. And that's some of our issues. I think it's some of our issues with our penal system. We're not rehabilitating people. We're not making them feel good about work. I hope this is making sense. When you think about the people that are not behind bars but don't work but still receive, you know what's happening? They're, they're being held captive in mental prisons and emotional prisons. Um, um, I, I think I've shared a lot about my own personal struggles and uh, And I and I and I God knows I've got them, um, but let me say it to you this way: 
There's nothing like knowing you got to get up and go to work to help rattle you out of depression. You got to go to work. Now you can get depressed, and you can get defeated, you can get discouraged, you can get all of those things. But um, a wife coming in and saying, "You got to go to work." It's a good thing. A baby crying because it needs milk. It's a good thing. I hope I'm making sense. Uh, Work's good. Work is not a part of the curse. Work is a part of God. Work is a part of God. And so anyway, thank God, I'm still able to get out of bed and go to work. And I'm grateful for it more and more all the time. The men and women that I know who can't anymore, they, I, the, ones that, the ones that I know, they would tell you, I'd give up if I could go back to work, give up whatever this is, you know. I would, I would, I'd give that up if I could go back to work. Um, most, most people that, uh, well, I'll just say it this way, the honest people that I know that end up disabled. My, my father ended up disabled, and I'm telling you, he'd have rather worked, you know. <laughs> you know? Uh, so... Let's dismiss in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for your kindness. Sincerely, thank you, Lord, for giving us strength and health. Thank you for letting us work. Help us to accept that you are at work and that Work is a part of your creation. And help us to do what you've called us to do while we still have the time. Help us to follow the words of Jesus that we must do the work that you've sent us to do while it's day. In Jesus' name, amen.